Hey, 42 here. Japan is a land of tradition. It's a country where ancient customs are revered. But Japan also has a long history of embracing cutting edge ideas and technologies. Like toilets that shoot water directly at your scrotum. And vending machines that sell, well, yeah. That's a bit of a contradiction, isn't it? How can a country that's so deeply rooted in tradition be one of the most technologically advanced on earth? Well, the truth is that Japan's evolution from a feudal society as recently as the 19th century to a global economic powerhouse come the 20th century is actually one of the most remarkable stories in human history. If you need an example of how eagerly Japan can embrace a technology when it wants to, look no further than the digital camera. Although an American invention, Japan quickly snapped it up and monopolized a market the likes of which I don't think I've seen in any other consumer tech product. Sony, Japanese. Canon, Japanese. Nikon, Japanese. Fujifilm, Japanese. Panasonic, Japanese. Olympus, Japanese. Pentax, Japanese. Anyway, you get the picture. Sorry. Although, arguably, Japan's technological export game peaked in 1958 when they invented instant ramen. Oodles of noodles in a cup in an instant? <laughs> Screw the digital camera, that's the pinnacle of human achievement right there. And all of this from Japan, a country that only opened its doors to the outside world in 1853, at about the same time steam trains were first gaining traction in Britain. Now, just a quick warning that this is going to be a difficult video for me. It's all about a technology that we invented, then decided to be so utterly crap at come the 21st century that almost everyone else now does it better. Anyway, what was it that suddenly catapulted the nation of Japan from a feudal society to a technological superpower seemingly overnight? The answer is simple, a revolution. A revolution catalyzed by a single technology that changed everything. A technology that, in the space of a few decades, broke down seemingly insurmountable barriers and connected what were previously out of reach intellectual minds and financial hubs. And the result? Japan exploded, humbly making a mockery of the rest of the world in the process. This is the fascinating story of the Shinkansen the Japanese bullet train. The opening of Japan's first railway line in 1872 represented a welcome sign of progress. But the trains were slow and unreliable, and the steam engine frequently broke down, leaving passengers stranded for hours at a time. As Japan grew in the first half of the 20th century, more and more railway lines were being built. But the issues that plagued the first train stuck around. By the 1950s, the average speed of a Japanese train was a paltry 36 miles an hour. And it wasn't uncommon for a trip from Tokyo to Osaka, a distance of just 300 miles, to take over seven hours. And the infrastructure made no sense either. Tracks often followed the winding course of rivers, rather than the shortest distance between two cities, meaning trains were constantly slowing down to weave their way around bends. By this point, the first cars and aeroplanes had already arrived in Japan, and overnight the populace came to favour them over the sluggish trains. However, in 1958, the country was preparing to host the Olympic Games, and Japan was keen to show the world that it had evolved significantly since the end of the Second World War, and was now a modern nation capable of hosting the most prestigious sporting event on the planet. But their embarrassing rail system didn't exactly shout progress. So, in 1959, the Japanese government solidified plans for their first ever high-speed railway line. The project would cost more than Jeff Bezos' divorce. Actually, nothing costs that much. But at an estimated 200 billion yen, about 1 billion pounds, it would be pricey. However, the government was willing to spend big. This was about more than just getting people from A to B. This was a statement, a reaffirmation to the world that, yes, Japan had been defeated, but it was now ready to rise again from the ashes as a phoenix, a sexy metal train-shaped phoenix. But to pull this off, the Shinkansen engineers would have to innovate in quite a few ways. For a start, unlike other train systems, which often shared tracks with slower local trains, 
the Shinkansen would operate on its own dedicated routes. Moreover, these tracks were engineered with banked turns, allowing the train to maintain its blistering speed even through curves. They weren't building a railway, they were building a goddamn roller coaster. To enhance the smoothness of the ride, the tracks employed continuous welded rails. Traditionally, tracks were short segments bolted together, which incidentally is the primary cause of the all too familiar click clack noise. The Shinkansen's seamless tracks meant less friction, which meant higher speeds, which meant less maintenance. And when your entire country is prone to sporadic Godzilla attacks, having to fix stuff less often is a godsend. To ensure the Shinkansen would be stable at such high speeds, it was necessary for the existing Cape Gauge tracks, at 3 feet 6 inches wide, to be beefed up to what we now call Standard Gauge, at a girthy 4 feet 8.5 inches. Level crossings were eliminated too, bridges were utilised frequently along the route so cars don't have to slow down for trains, and vice versa. Rather than coil springs, the Shinkansen used a revolutionary air spring suspension system to increase comfort and stability. And of course, the Shinkansen was given an iconically massive pointy nose. It looked like pure science fiction in the 60s, and it was a hallmark of aerodynamic design, meticulously crafted to minimise air resistance and to suppress tunnel boom, the loud booming noise created when a train enters a tunnel at high velocity. They even created a special diagnostics train, nicknamed Dr. Yellow. This bright yellow rolling stock is equipped with special sensors to monitor the condition of the tracks below and the overhead wires, all so that faults in the network can be detected as quickly and efficiently as possible. And all these efforts paid off. The fastest steam train in Japan at the time topped out at 60 miles per hour, and the first Shinkansen railway, now known as the Takedo Line, had a top speed of 130 miles per hour, more than double. That might not sound particularly fast by today's standards, but it was a game changer for the people of Japan. It slashed the average journey time from Tokyo to Osaka to just four hours. We've got a train that takes longer than that in England, and it only goes to f***ing Wigan. Then in 1975, the Sanyo Shinkansen extension line was built, connecting Tokyo all the way to Fukuoka. You could now go from f***ing Fukuoka to Tokyo, a distance of 680 miles, in just five hours, without changing trains. The people of Fukuoka thought this was Fukuoking brilliant. But the success of the Shinkansen wasn't just due to the massive reduction in journey times, they were also remarkably reliable, something that couldn't be said for their conventional cousins. A railway line is like a choose-your-own-adventure book. Every few miles there's a point where the train can go one way or the other. And just like in a choose-your-own-adventure book, making the wrong choice can mean the difference between getting to work on time or ending up naked in a swamp with your ear being mauled by a horny otter. If a train passes a junction and follows the wrong track, the driver can't simply pull a U-turn, the train will have to keep going until it reaches the next station, at which point it can change tracks and go back the way it came. In order to avoid scheduled deviations which were plaguing conventional train lines, the Shinkansen were equipped with an automated system called Centralised Traffic Control that allowed them to seamlessly navigate even the most complex junctions without having to slow down for a second. Together with a second automated safety system called Automatic Train Control ATC, also developed for the Shinkansen, the system could automatically slow down any train on the network depending on the speed of the trains ahead or behind it, and intervene if a driver fails to respond to hazards in time. Now, contrary to popular belief, the original Shinkansen trains never actually levitated. That requires something called maglev technology, which has only been employed in real life sporadically over the years, usually for very short journeys like airport shuttles. Most notably, the Shanghai Maglev was opened in 2004, offering top speeds of 270 miles per hour. Although, to be honest, the Shanghai Maglev is completely bloody useless. It only covers a distance of 19 miles over 7.5 minutes, which is impressive, but it means that by the time it reaches full speed in the middle of its journey, it has to start slowing down again. As a result, it averages a speed of 155 miles per hour, slower than a non-Maglev high-speed train. I guess this is what happens when a country has too much disposable income. Anyway, despite not levitating, the original Shinkansen trains were designed specifically to minimise friction and vibration in every way, so they could glide along the tracks like Usain Bolt with a greased-up arse. 
Even though the trains were travelling at 130 miles per hour, you could balance a coin on its edge and it wouldn't fall over. Passengers could place cups of teas on the window ledges in a knowledge they wouldn't spill. This might seem rather mundane to us today, but back in the 60s, it was as if the laws of physics had been rewritten. Further construction of the Shinkansen network was rapid. Now, there are nine individual but interconnected Shinkansen lines and counting. Connecting the entire country all the way from Sapporo in the north to Kagoshima in the south, with the fastest train in Japan now cruising at a speedy 200 miles per hour. Today, the average delay for a Shinkansen train is less than one minute. And that includes delays caused by natural disasters. To put that into perspective, a British train being delayed by less than one minute is rarer than seeing a unicorn shitting gold coins inside a weather spoons. And that's because our trains are so old, the tracks are made from the bones of Victorian children. Speaking of natural disasters, Shinkansen lines are fitted with earthquake detection systems, which can automatically cut power to trains if early warning signs are detected of a potentially dangerous earthquake. Which is nice to know, I guess. The implications of the Shinkansen went beyond convenience. Economically, cities that were connected by the Shinkansen experienced unprecedented growth. From Osaka to Nagoya to Hiroshima. It was like a game of Monopoly where everyone wins and you don't spend four hours threatening to murder your family for not selling you Mayfair. Furthermore, the Shinkansen revolutionised the way people lived and worked. Families no longer had to uproot for job opportunities. Someone could work in Tokyo but choose to live in a quieter city like Shizuoka and commute daily. Such a concept was unthinkable before the Shinkansen. And the effects rippled around the globe. Japan had taken a billion pound gamble and pretty much placed it all on a single train system. And boy did it pay off. Transforming it from a broken post-war economy to being the third richest country on the freaking planet. And that's enough to make all the other countries stand up and take notice. The Shinkansen success story inspired the construction of similar high-speed rail systems, like the TGV in France, the AVE in Spain, Germany's ICE, and many more three-letter acronym-inclined nations. But it can be argued that none have managed to emulate the success of the Shinkansen. You see, there are now faster trains out there, sure, but speed was never the primary goal of Shinkansen's design. It was capacity. It was designed to move large numbers of people very quickly. This is a small country with 125 million people, and it has the world's largest city. And today, during peak times, a high-speed train departs from Tokyo every three minutes. Every single day, about a quarter of a million people ride the Shinkansen in Japan. Also, after 50 years of continuous operation and over 10 billion passengers, the Shinkansen has never had a single fatal accident officially making it the world's safest train system. And now, Japan is once again looking to the future, as it always has done. New lines are being developed using superconducting maglev technology, like in Shanghai, which promises speeds of up to 310 miles per hour. When complete, the Chuo Shinkansen will be the longest maglev route in the world, and a trip from Tokyo to Osaka will take a breathtaking 67 minutes. The primary driving force behind the inception of the first ever Shinkansen was a humble engineer, Hideo Shima, an employee of Japanese National Railways, who was intensely passionate about the future of trains and their core role in public mass transit. He had a vision, and fortunately, his government listened to him. So, you see, the Shinkansen was never just a train. And it was never about speed, or world-leading safety, or having shiny new toys to show off. It was a symbol. A symbol of Japan's resilience, innovation, and vision. It was about saying, this is what's possible when government funds are put into projects that make sense for and directly benefit the people, rather than vanity projects designed to win elections. Personally, I think most countries can learn a lesson or two from this humble electric train. Because the bullet train well and truly shot Japan into the 21st century and beyond. Thanks for watching.